Real football. It is starting this week. The Cincinnati Bengals are actually going to be playing their first real game action of 2017 in a preseason opener against the Buccaneers. We're going to be talking about all of the things to watch in that preseason opener coming up on Friday evening. Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony Cazenza. This is the Orange and Black Insider. Thanks for joining us live. Thanks for, um, if you're not able to join us live, thanks for downloading the program. We hope you have been enjoying it. And I am, as usual, joined by my my co-host, Scott Schulte, my, my partner in crime. How are you, sir? You're wearing a jersey, first of all. For those of you who listen to the audio, wear it and, and don't look at the video necessarily that we post up on YouTube, Scott is wearing a particular jersey, I just noticed. Uh, Scott. What player is that that you are donning today? So you're not supposed to be able to tell who it is. You're just supposed <laughs> to be able to tell the jersey because it is much more comfortable. And I, I'll i just say that I happened to get this one a month before someone said he would never play again in Cincinnati. Okay. Well, well I hope you got it on sale. And so uh, the, Yeah, I am. Yeah, we are very much the, uh, you know, the – the you know knockoff made in China very unofficial, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, and that's kind of I think the etic- That's a good question as far as the etiquette okay, when we have to bring up sometime is like at what point is it okay to wear like a Jonathan Joseph jersey who left for more Gatorade <laughs> or a Carson Palmer jersey or you know something like that. Uh, I mean, certain ones obviously you can wear forever. Other ones, I think at some point, uh, yeah. So. I'm not well, going to say who those, it is, but if you can't if you can't figure it out, I, I won't tell you who it is. But the player's name rhymes with Barson Walmer, and uh, so you can figure out who who that might be. But uh, good to have you, Scott. You know what? Last week was a lot of fun. We had we had a couple of special guests. We had James Rapine of ESPN Cincinnati and uh, Mark Powell, who wrote uh, the the Legends of Legends of the Jungle book. I thought that was a really fun show. That was interview heavy. Today's going to be really analyzing this upcoming game and taking listener questions. So if you are joining us live and you have some questions that you want answered on air, we are taking those. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at Bengals OBI and send them there. You can, uh, if, if you're watching us via cincyjungle.com, there is a comment thread there that you can submit your questions. And then there's uh, also our live YouTube feed where you can join other Bengals fans every episode, talk Bengals, talk about what we're talking about on the show and submit your questions to us there. Uh, we would love to interact with you and we are taking some questions to, to end this show. Um, so fire those at us. Over the past couple of, of weeks, we didn't really do one last week because we had those special guests, but over the past couple of weeks, Scott, we've been doing a, a question of the show or a question of the night. Um, you kind of came up with this one. I thought it was it was pretty interesting, especially for those who may have listened to last week's show before we had our guests on. We talked a little bit about some of the recent findings that uh, some – uh, high-profile doctors made on former football players in the CTE that was found in, in their brains, the ages they passed away at, all of that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, a variety of factors that play into that, um, but some scary stuff that that occurs with that. There was also, for those who did not see, there was also a very interesting article related to that um, with uh, former Raiders and Patriots quarterback Jim Plunkett, who played in the 70s and 80s, He's really suffering from a lot of stuff, including, um, you know, some some head injury stuff. So uh, obviously still a major hot topic in the NFL. And our question of the show, thanks to Scott Schulze, is, um, you know, last week we, we talked about how he and I both have, have young sons and uh, how we might, um, you know, we want our sons to participate in athletics and all of that. Football is a sport that's that's uh, we're passionate about and one where it, it provides a, a kid great exercise, discipline, all of a lot of good things come out of it. However, there's also the injury stuff, the head injury stuff. So we want to ask you, for those who have not participated in the question of the show, live viewers, if you have a, a young child and you are thinking of having them participate in tackle football, would you or are you inclined to do so? Or is some of this news that uh, these players, even from high school 
um, and maybe even before that, are getting these head injuries and, and sustaining some long-term damage potentially to their bodies and their minds. Um, does that scare you away if you have a young child or, or if you don't have a young child, if you, had, uh, if you had one and you were thinking about getting them into football, would that scare you away? And Scott, we touched on it a little bit last week. Wait, did, did you have any expanded thoughts on that? Yeah, we had, yeah, as you mentioned, we briefly touched on this last week, and then I think one of our guests jumped on, um, Rapine, so we just went ahead and kind of cut it short. So just to kind of summarize what the article or the report came out and said and what the, we had on the Cincy Jungle article, it basically showed that, you know, players who had repeated head trauma who were suspected to have CTE when they were studied, it turned out they did, and it showed a large number of the NFL players who were studied something like 114 of 115 had it um, only like three out of 14 high school kids did the numbers kind of went up as you went further along unfortunately it's very in inconclusive as far as proving anything and i think that's where one of the big challenges is as far as you know deciding whether you would let your kids play or not because it's a degenerative disease so the older you get the more likely it is to show up because it has more time to develop uh, so, you know, you could get it when you're playing high school football, but if you die in high school and you're studied, you know, you may not show anything, but let's say you live and you go on to play college and pro ball, you could show it, which may or may not be related to getting, you know, it during college or pro. It may just be you got it in high school and it just took that long to develop. So when you died in the 60s and you lived many years or when you died in your 80s or 90s and you had it, well, that's the thing they don't know yet is did you get it? when you were younger and it just took that long to develop and show up, or did you get it because there's re repeated hits? And they know that it comes from head trauma, from banging your head, and the theory is, well, if you're hitting your head more, you're more likely to get it. So the theory is if you play college or, and then into pros, you're playing it more often, so you are getting those injuries, but at the same time, you also have this uh, parallel track that the longer you live, the more likely it is to show up if you get it at a younger age. So you don't really know what's leading to it um and they've only really looked they haven't looked at a lot of other sports they have i think they looked at boxing i mean boxing obviously you're getting punched in the head all the time um they haven't looked at things like things like soccer that much um, and you don't really yep. hear about a lot of soccer suicides but you watch like the world cup or these things like they're constantly doing these headers and hitting ball and it's maybe a little different but i would think if you're constantly bouncing a ball off your head you know that can't be very good for you either right um and so there's there's still a lot to be determined. It's kind of like the, the climate change debate that people have. They're like, yeah, you know, we see that temperature went up, but scientists on both sides debate what is causing it. And it's kind of where you are at the CTE thing that, yeah, we know that, you know, people who do get in these activities do seem to get it, but we don't know where it comes from. So very hard. I mean, you, you obviously want to err on the side of safety, but at this time it's very conclusions without having a lot of the evidence. Um, so to answer your question, I guess getting all that out of the way, um, I would be inclined to avoid um, my son playing football. I mean, if he decides he's going to play um, or really wants to play, I think it's a discussion we'd have to have as far as, hey, a lot of the consequences, here's the things that can happen. And it's not, it's not just head injuries. I mean, you look at some of these guys that when they retire, they have, you know, they have all the scars and all the, you know, the fake bones and the you know knee joints and the elbows and the, all the other things they've had and where they have trouble walking and they're all the painkillers and they're using the medical marijuana or the Vicodin. And, and so you have a lot of other issues with the very physically demanding sport as opposed to some of these other ones they could go in. I mean, if you can go into golf or swimming, the, that might be a little less dangerous unless you get by a stray golf ball or something. But I guess all things being equal, it, it wouldn't be my first choice for him to play. Now, that being said, my son, as much as a three-year-old can, seems to love playing football. Uh, he, Whenever we get out the toys and the balls and go play, uh, that's the one he wants to play. He wants to play the one where he runs into me and knocks me down <laughs> in the game where I give him the ball and try to chase him and knock him down. And that's what we were doing before the podcast was we were playing, you know, toddler version of football. And, you know, who knows if that's, you know, turn it into anything when he's 10 or 20. But at this point, that seems to be the one he's gravitating to. So it's it's kind of cool because, we're you know, we obviously, as you mentioned, like the sport. But at the same time, like, well, is this something I really want him doing if it could have long-term consequences when they're older? So 
it's very hard to say. I'd say it wouldn't be my first choice, but I guess we'll have to see what happens as he gets a little older, if that's still his interest or, or who knows what it would be. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to, and, and uh, first of all, to your point uh, about other sports and research and all of that stuff, uh, we do have Tom Brooks in our live YouTube chat who said, what, what sample of those who didn't play football did they have, or did they provide? Um, I mean, there's just not uh, in, in terms of other sports or, um, you know, may, maybe someone who had just a couple of car accidents that did that never really played sports that often, but banged their head a couple. You know, there, there's all kinds of different variables that goes into this thing. But obviously, this is a sport where guys they knock heads uh, for you know for year g- games, numerous games every year, and depending on when they start, whether it's high school, whether it's uh, before that, maybe even you know walk on in college, whatever the case may be. I mean, these are guys that are hitting their heads quite often. For me. And what we're talking about with, you know, my son and, and, you know, as a parent, it's obviously you want the best for your child and you want them to be healthy. You want them to be safe. You want, you know, all, all the good things for them. But at the same time, you know, if, if they have a passion and or show a talent for something, um, you want them to pursue that talent and you want them to pursue, uh, you know, some happiness that comes with excelling in a sport, excelling in an activity and art, whatever the case may be. So, um, you know, there, there's, it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Uh, I, I kind of say, well, you know, there, there's, uh, obviously kids start pretty young in terms of pop Warner and, and tackle football and all of that, th- all of those things. So maybe, you know, maybe there's some flag football things that could be done through elementary and, uh, middle school. And then maybe we look at high school football. I don't know. Um, you know, obviously my, my son's very, very young still, and this is something I'd, Thankfully, don't have to deal with for for a little while yet. But uh, you know, I, I think obviously you make a great point about you know safety and and all of that, and, and you want that for your child. But um, you know, obviously, there you also want them to be happy and pursue a talent and and all of that if they're if they're good at it. So uh, that is our question of the the show: Are, are you willing if you if you have a young child or if you um, even if you don't, it's a hypothetical too, and you have a young child that you uh, might be thinking about putting into football with all of these CTE issues popping up. Would you be willing to do so? Um, given all of that new information, let us know in the YouTube chat. Let us know at CincyJungle.com. Scott, you had a you had another um, before we start previewing the, the preseason game. You had a little more a little more thoughts on. Uh, yeah, just a Stop. couple more points. Answer the question that was in the YouTube chat. Uh, as far as that report that came out, there really was no data on non-football because all the brains that were studied came from what they call a brain bank, where these brains were donated by the families after the person died. And it's something you, you can't really tell if someone has CTEC or CTE until they are dead because they have to dissect the brain and look for um, these telltale signs there's i forget the what they're called the abscesses or whatever that they find in the brain and the the quantity of them per you know so many square inches or whatever like that so they can kind of tell if they have it so you can't tell when they're alive Uh, and the only people who have donated are people who thought okay we think this person you know this guy played football he seemed to have some issues mental issues dementia whatever he died they donated it those they checked you know regular non-football players you know, there aren't too many of them who have been donated into these brain banks, and these have kind of become more popular since the whole concussion things come out You know, over the last decade. Uh, so at some point, may have more data, and that gets to the thing earlier, we just don't have the information to know. And I think another thing is it's hard to go off of is that you know, the people who they're studying, who are these old people like Mike Webster, who is the very popular case that bent, that the Dr. Malu did uh, that was in the movie that Will Smith was in called Concussion, is that the players who they're studying now who, you know, made it to their seventies and eighties or sixties and died are players who played in an era when it wasn't as safe for the head. I mean, not that it's really safe now, but the equipment wasn't as good. The the helmets weren't as thick. They didn't have the concussion protocols. You know, you just give them some smelling salts and send them back on the field. Well, And also, and also penalties on hits that, you know, that now you, 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 you can't hit defenseless receivers. You can't. And that stuff wasn't also uh, really enforced then either. Yeah, so it's hard to look at someone who played in like the 70s, you know, when when Anthony Munoz was playing or even before him, you know, Bob Johnson and Trump, you know, look at that, the guys playing in that era and saying, 
you know, trying to conclude how safe it is or not, you know, in today's era or what it will be like when our kids are playing in 10, 20 years if they play. It's uh, so, yeah, there's a, a whole lot of unknowns. And then I don't know if you saw Boomer Sison said something recently, made a comment how he's pretty sure he has CT. And there's really no way to tell I me. Mean, you won't know until he's dead because you, you would have to dissect his brain. And it almost seems like this thing people are jumping on. Oh, I played football. Obviously, I have it. Or I'd hate to think it becomes a scapegoat where anytime a former football player does something, oh, that's not me. It's CTE. Or it's not my, you know, I, it's not my fault. I, I have this, uh, you know, condition. And I'm sure some of them do. But, yeah, it's very hard to um, say and I, I will add one more thing before I move on. I'm sorry. I know I keep adding stuff. But you were talking about my jersey. I just realized um, I have a nine on this sleeve and a nine on that sleeve. So it's actually 99. So I think it's Marcus Hunt or someone okay. like that. It's okay. just broken up. Okay. Okay. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt there. Uh, so for the for the question of the night, we've got a couple of – um, we've got a couple of more comments in our, in our live YouTube chat. Obviously, uh, Tom Brooks, who came up with the first – uh, great question about you know sample of non football players. He also mentioned usage of steroids in in the era of uh, a lot of these guys who have you know they had their brains studied. You mentioned Mike Webster. There's a lot of lot of talk about steroid use in this the, those seventies and eighties Steelers teams that that were quite successful, but a lot of talk of steroid use there. Um, obviously Lyle Alzado was a big guy, and he I mean not only was he a steroid guy, I think there was cocaine use and, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of stuff with, with him. But um, obviously the sport, there's danger to it. Uh, it comes with it. Uh, Royal flush five, one, three in, um, in the YouTube chats is as much as I like football. I don't think I would allow my son in parentheses. I have no kids to play football. So that's, that's from the hypothetical standpoint there. Thanks for the feedback. Keep, keep shooting us some responses. We'll, we'll keep checking in on that. And we, as I mentioned, we are taking listener questions at the end of this show. Um, so shoot those over to us. We've already got a couple our way, so we're going to try and get to uh, all of them or most of them, but shoot them over at us in the YouTube chat or the live uh, comment thread at Cincy Jungle or on Twitter at Bengals OBI. And if you're new to this podcast, you can get this show on a number of different uh, platforms. If you are joining us live, awesome. Do that every episode if you can. Uh, otherwise, you can download the program on iTunes, on SoundCloud, as I mentioned, YouTube, and all of the content is also on cincyjungle.com. Uh, so, so download it there, as well as check out all of the news and updates that the crew there does. Uh, they stay quite on top of things and provide a lot of different, not only breaking news, but a lot of different analysis and whatnot. We're going to talk about the Bengals and their preseason opener where they where they host the Buccaneers. And kind of interesting because the Buccaneers are on Hard Knocks, so you'll probably get a little bit of, of Bengals on, on one of the episodes of Hard Knocks coming up here. But before we do, I'm um, just kind of leading into the analysis portion. Um, and, and thank you to my co-host, Scott, for bringing this to my attention. Um, as a reminder, the Bengals on Wednesday, and and of you because he's been a guy that a lot of people have been rooting for. Um, Jake Kumarau has been released or waived by the Bengals, uh, so he is not. And he's he had been battling an injury. Um, he had hoped to obviously um, make you know make a splash this year, even though the Bengals. Drafted John Ross and uh, Josh Malone, and added Cody Core last year. Uh, obviously, they you know he wanted to try and latch on as he could. Um, pretty crowded receiver room, and um, uh, you know, just just didn't work. Um, didn't work out. So um, they did sign a free agent punter, Will Monday, to take his uh, take his spot um, on the on the roster. Unlikely he beats out Kevin Huber <laughs> for a spot, but obviously they, they felt they, they saw a need there and, and probably saving Huber um, throughout the preseason. Uh, we've kind of talked about how this preseason might be about really seeing young guys, the undrafted guys, the low round guys, proving themselves and saving your veterans, given the fact that that 90, that 90 man to 53 man cut down day is towards the end of preseason now and not kind of a staggered thing any any thoughts uh comments on kumarao and uh his very interesting 
probably the most interesting time by a Bengals player had in Cincinnati that never really produced anything, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people seem to be pulling for him for various reasons, whether it be the hair, the unheralded school, the um, you know preseason. Uh, yeah, he had, he, had, he had a lot of support for a guy who unfortunately never made it on the active roster and played. Um, and I don't want to f- blame myself for him being cut and hurt, but I will say I was down there a week ago, and he was the player I got closest to. And um, said something to, and he happened to be the one who got hurt the next day and then got released a couple of days later. So if I had anything to do with that, I feel horrible. <laughs> and the other thing I'll add, it's, it's just very interesting that um, you know, when this news came out, basically the Bengals on Wednesday announced they will sign Will Monday. And I know when I first saw it, it was very confusing. It talks about how they signed a punter on Monday. I'm like, wait, it's Wednesday. What happened to Monday? I'm like, okay, so the Bengals on Wednesday will sign, mon- you know, Monday. Yeah, it, it was just very, it was very confusing. They signed we Monday on Wednesday. Yes. And, you know, turns out Monday was not available for, well, for comment on Wednesday, but the Bengals were available for comment on Wednesday about Monday. So just, yeah, very, very, uh, <laughs> Hard to cue, cue the rim shots, folks. <laughs> right. That's um, what we producer. No, no, you're hey, yeah, you're the resident comedian, my friend. I'm I'm but dry. As, the, like we need the guy on the side with like all the special effects. <laughs> I'm dry as toast over here. You you bring the comedy. I love it. I love it. Well, that's that's kind of some news and notes now that the Bengals are heading into their first preseason game. So Scott, let's talk about this game. Very interesting to me. This game is very interesting to me because of how different this Bengals team looks from a year ago. Um, obviously, a lot younger, a lot faster, a lot of new faces. There's still obviously the familiar cast of characters and stars that this team has had really since 2010, 2011. Um, but obviously, there's the, the Marvin Lewis and, and company are, are going to be looking at what some of these young guys, these mid late undrafted guys do these mid round, late round dra- undrafted guys do uh, in, in this game and, and in the games ahead. Um, usually the first game starters barely play. They play a little bit more in the second. And then that third game is the dress rehearsal, so to speak. Um, I still don't think we'll be seeing a ton of uh, the Bengals starters throughout the entire preseason, just because of the injuries they suffered last year and all of that. But um Give me a couple players you really think, well, that you, not only you are interested in, but you think our listeners should be watching, whether they catch the live telecast, whether they're there in person, whether they catch a delayed telecast. Give, give a couple of Bengals players that, that we should all be keeping an eye on in your eyes. I'd say first and foremost, the most important one, in my opinion, the guy that we absolutely need to be paying attention to is on the first team offense, left tackle Cedric Aboyhe. Because as good as this team has gotten at the skill positions, you mentioned some of the guys they've added with John Ross, and uh, you know they obviously have AJ Green, they have Tyler Eifert healthy, they they added Joe Mix. You know, the the one thing they need to do is give Dalton time to throw the ball and get some lanes for these guys to run, which of course happens in the offensive line. The line struggled a little bit last year, and the two best players from last year on the line, Whitworth and Zeitler, are now in Los Angeles and Cleveland, respectively. So the success of the offense and probably the whole team is really going to depend on how well they can keep Dalton vertical. And, you know, that pretty much starts at the, uh, the money position, which is that left tackle, which is pretty yep. much a way he's. And what we've seen from training camp is Phil Winston, the serviceable backup he was last year. Uh, they're talking about moving Trey Hopkins over there as, you know, the contingency plan. So, and I like Trey Hopkins, but I don't think he's ever really played left tackle at this level. Um, so you're pretty much looking at a boy here bust as far as that left tackle position goes. And as bad as he looked last year, you know, that's a very scary proposition. And there's a lot of hype, you know, or a lot of hope, maybe hype and hope going into the off season. So that's just one that we, we just need to see is for his first, I don't know how, if the offense will be out there, I don't know how long, maybe a quarter or so to see, how does he do against NFL starting caliber, you know, 
right defensive end or you know blitzes it gets or even just base package you know the running game like what yeah that, that's the one i just absolutely need to see to have any level of confidence going into this season i think a lot of people are with you on that one uh it, depending on how the buccaneers uh, divvy out their playing time in this first game or, or what have you um we might be seeing Cedric Abwehi go up against uh, Robert Ayers, who actually, ironically, visited the Bengals a, a few years ago. Um, he's up there in age, but still kind of is that guy that puts up, you know, about six, seven sacks a year and, and is a, a decent, solid defensive end. Um, and then there's there's also, uh, I believe, Noah Spence, a guy that they bring in um, on on certain packages as well. A first, I, I believe he's a first-round pick or high pick from a year ago um, and had a pretty good, pretty good rookie season. I believe he had five or six sacks as well. Um, so two talented guys he could be going up against. And and it's really funny about Cedric Abwehi. I think obviously, like I said, I think most fans would agree with you on that one. Um, I think while we might not see a ton of snaps and preseason snaps from starters, I think you might be seeing quite a bit from him, quite a bit from Jake Fisher quite a bit from some of these guys that they need to say, you know, we need you out there. You need to go against real game competition, you know, real hitting all of that. And uh, you know, we might see some more extended time from those guys where they maybe play beyond the first unit and stick out there a little longer um, than some others. Anybody else that you're keeping an eye on besides Cedric Abwehi? Yeah. And this is kind of conversely <laughs> because of him. I mean, all the talk in OTAs, all the talk since the draft has been that mid-round pick, um, you know, Lawson has just been phenomenal. And that is something I really want to see is, okay, you know, is is he really that great because he is? I mean, obviously he was a very highly regarded uh, five-star, you know, all everything when he went to college. He was pretty good in college, although he had some injuries and some things, you know, pushed him into playing all four years and then not going in the first round or two, even though he was a late pass rusher. But he has been awesome. But he's been going up against the guys we just mentioned, Winston, Fisher, and Obwehi. So you know, let's see, how, how does he do against Donovan Smith? How does he do against DeMar Dotson? How does he do against a NFL starting offensive cast, who guys who have played offensive line before and done a, a decent job? You know, I'm hoping he's every bit as good as he's been in Bengals training camp, but it's just so hard to tell because of who he's been going against. And, it, it, you know, it, it could turn out that, hey, he's just phenomenal, and a oh boy, he's not that bad, but because Lawson's so great, he looks bad. Or it could be that turns out Lawson's not that good, but he's going up against someone who's really bad. So I think those are the two guys that, because we are expecting, you know, we need a boy, he to be so good. And the guy who's going against him has looked so good. I, I think we just need to see, okay, how do these guys do against other people? I so agree. For me, it's him. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously this uh, preseason games aren't that important, obviously, in terms of, you know, playoff picture or anything like that, because they're, they're essentially exhibition games that don't matter in terms of standings, but there are things to take away from, from these games. There are, uh, you know, uh, there's there's things that you, people need to need to look at. There's players that need to be watched. There are things that a team wants to achieve uh, in these in these games, even though they may lose. Um, you know, there could be some positives to be taken out of that based on what they do. Um, if you, since you went to Cedric Abwehi, I'm going to go the other side and go Jake Fisher. Uh, I think I think Jake Fisher is a guy that we got to keep an eye on. It, we, we might be going a little obvious with some of our picks so far, but um, you know, Jake Jake Fisher is a guy who is very athletic, but a guy that uh, like a boy he hasn't found his niche quite yet. He seems to have the inside track on the starting right tackle job. I've heard a couple of people say he's he's bulked up a tiny bit in terms of gained some some muscle mass and stuff. That's good. Um, there's, there was a little bit, you, you heard James Rapine last week, talk about a toughness issue with a boy. He there, there's, I don't want to say there's similar concerns with Fisher, but, um, he's not really known as a power type of player. He's more of an athletic, a bit more of a finesse type of player, if you will, than, than a power tackle, I guess. Um, so obviously a guy to watch, 
Um, uh, you know, whether it's paving the way in the run game, protecting Andy Dalton, a guy to look at. And I think also just in general, you know, I don't, I don't, there's, uh, you and I know, Scott, we could, we could sit here and list five, six, seven, eight guys a piece, uh, and, and say, you know, oh, I want to watch this guy. I want to watch this guy. And, I, you know, I could sit here and say, I want to, I want to watch a boy here. I want to watch Fisher. I want to watch Trey Hopkins. I want to watch Bodine. Yeah. It's probably I, like 90. I know. Seriously. <laughs> ser- yeah, seriously. You're, you're right. Um, Except for maybe Will Monday. No, just kidding. Uh, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, I really what I want to see, especially with either a starting five or if there's a a crew of, you know, maybe there's two or three still quote-unquote starters in there and a couple of fringe backup starter guys. I, I want to see the communication flow. I want to see them be able to pick up blitzes. I want to see them be able to pull on run plays. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to – instead of sitting here and saying, oh, every guy in the offensive line specifically, I kind of want to see how that unit is gelling at the moment and seeing how, you know, early on in camp, we heard some good things, uh, started to hear kind of some questionable things in terms of performance, heard some more positive things uh, in recent days. So kind of interesting to see how that's going to work out with uh, with teams there. Um, I also think that I uh, I'm interested in our man, Joe Mixon. I, I, I think we we uh, might be seeing a, a very good player come about right now, and uh, I, I, I think I'm surprised you didn't pick him. He's your boy, but he's looked great in training camp, and he's a guy that I think um, most Bengals fans are eager to see. Correct? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, I mean, obviously, when he was drafted, I think it was very hit and miss as far as the reaction. Some Bengals fans were beside themselves in joy; other ones were beside themselves in frustration. But I think the ones who were upset probably after what we've seen in OTAs and in training camp when they hear all the glowing reviews and pretty much everyone who goes to training camp comes back saying, wow, this guy, you know, this play, wow, do you see him on that play? Wow, this guy is just the real deal, which is pretty awesome because, as you know, Jeremy Hill had some great moments his first year. Giovanni Bernard has had flashed some good moments, but no one really came away you know, raving like that. The last time I remember an offensive player really getting this amount of just wow from folks is um, AJ Green when he came to the Bengals. And I don't know if you recall, there was a, I think it was the first public training camp game, or first, sorry, practice. He went one-on-one against Leon Hall back when Leon Hall was still pretty healthy and a very good, you know, Pro Bowl cusp kind of a player. And they went head to head. AJ Green made this little, just very casual move and just sent um, Leon Hall falling on his backside. And one of those things you're just like, wow, this <laughs> this guy's amazing. And everything we've seen from AJ Green since then, just the the body control, the way he gets open, the way he makes great defensive backs look silly, the way he burned you, know, even Daryl Revis or Revis last year in the opening game. I mean, he just. Uh, is this phen- and that's the same kind of reviews in the raves, you know, all the, everything we're getting about Mixon and training camp is, you know, all the upside, all the hype, all the wow that we're getting from him. So yeah, it's very hard not to be excited. Um, but yeah, that was to say, um, yeah, it's, he's a very interesting, very exciting one to look at. Yeah. I, you know, obviously, obviously Mixon's a guy that everybody is, is looking at and uh, he's kind of the guy that, um, seems to be the most exciting, exciting draft pick of of the of the group for a variety of reasons. Uh, I, I guess, I guess, I mean, like I said, we could go on uh, another guy. I kind of want to watch William Jackson. Um, the the Buccaneers have quite a bit of exciting, exciting receivers. Whether their starters are a little bit behind them, it's, you know. Adam Jones and Drake Kirkpatrick might not be playing all that much uh, in this game. So William Jackson should be getting extensive time. And it's really his first, his first taste of NFL football, uh, even though it's preseason, even though it's week one and, and, you know, it's not the most intense type of situation. I mean, this is his first taste of NFL football. So I'll be watching him and see how he stacks up against uh, a variety of different players on Tampa Bay as well. I, I, good segue, though, Scott, to the uh, the matchups. I mean, this is kind of a little bit similar. Uh, we talked about Abuehi against Robert Ayers and, and Noah Spence and a couple of others. Uh, are there specific player matchups you might be looking at this week 
Um, obviously, Tampa's not a team that Cincinnati plays often. But, uh, you know, they've got some talent. The Bengals have some talent. There's a couple that I have in mind. What about you? Yeah, there's um... – I'd say as far as the one matchup, just because if you go back to oh, whenever the heck it was, 2010 or no, before that, whenever Geno Atkins was drafted, I think we got Carlos Dunlap and Geno Atkins in that same draft. Um, they might have been, maybe it was 2010. Um, the Buccaneers got a pretty good one in Gerald McCoy. Granted, we got ours much later. We didn't have to use a top three pick to get him. But uh, as much as we've kind of... Um, grumbled or harped on Russell Bodine for <laughs> struggling and as much as pro football focus and anyone not named uh, Paul Alexander has pretty much um, harped on Bodine. It'll be very interesting to see what the interior of our offensive line, we've talked about the outside, but seeing what the inside can do, what, what can bowling do? What can Smith assuming he's starting right guard? And then, but you know, what, what can those three guys do against someone who's pretty much as good, you know, McCoy and Atkins are both considered, you know, elite three technique defensive tackles. So uh, they obviously get to see one of them every day in practice. So it'd be interesting to see them go up against another one. The the other one, the other matchup I think is kind of interesting. Isn't so much a matchup, but it's more, uh, there's just some very similar players in similar situations, kind of like the Gino Atkins and Gerald McCoy that I think would be kind of interesting because these guys have practiced, obviously the Bengals have practiced against their own players, um, you know, for the past, since training camp began a few weeks ago. And we're playing a team that has some very similar players. One would be Deshaun Jackson, who was just signed as a free agent from the Washington Redskins in the off season. John Ross, who we just drafted, the biggest comp that pretty much everyone's making is, Hey, that's Deshaun Jackson. And then the other one, obviously the two elite defensive tackles, uh, in McCoy and Atkins. The other one's very interesting is the kicker situation. As you may re- recall, last year, the Buccaneers not only used a high pick on a kicker, Robert Aguayo, they moved up to use a second round pick on a kicker <laughs> and drafted Robert uh, Roberto Aguayo. I think maybe middle, late of the second round. Uh, that did not go very well last year. I think he barely made 70% of his kicks. Yep. He had a uh, very he missed he did not make anything beyond fifty yards he missed a few extra points just did not have a very good season as a result they brought in Nick Folk and all indications seem to be that they're pretty much deadlocked right now so a second round pick and a journeyman off the uh, I guess off the the street so to speak are pretty much tied which kind of brings up okay the Bengals situation we just we just drafted a guy not in the second round. But Jake Elliott was the first kicker drafted in this draft. He was taken in the fifth round, um, pretty much a round or two before Zane Gonzalez and the rest of the kickers. I'm just looking forward to seeing you know, seeing how, how our rookie kicker does versus theirs. I mean, theirs was horrible. He was the first one taken, had a bad first year, struggling to make the team his second year. So it's just that, that whole thing of, the, of, of having similar players on the two teams and just seeing how our version does versus theirs. You know, I'm hoping Jake Elliott – has a better first rookie year. I'm hoping it looks better in training camp. So just kind of seeing the, you know, the comparable guys, because there are uh, some comparisons. I mean, the Aguayo Elliott comparison, I think the uh, McCoy and Atkins comparison, and a few of the others, the Deshaun Jackson, John Ross. Uh, so, you know, just the things like that, just seeing, you know, how does the Bengals version of their, this great guy do versus theirs. You can even go like, you know, the, I'm going to screw his name up. Levante David versus Devontae's perfect. You know, they both have a great linebacker. We have, we have a lot of players who seem to be kind of similar as far as the position they play and how their skill set is. So it's just very interesting to, you know, see Bengals version versus Bucks version. And obviously you know, we're hoping the Bengals version is better. Yes. And if you remember a lot of Bengals fan fans a year ago, really wanted Aguayo to land with with the Bengals, um, and they stuck with Nugent. We know what happened there. So the Bengals now went went with Elliott uh, this year. Obviously, not as high of a draft pick as Aguayo, but definitely concerning uh, if you're the Bengals and Bengals for Bengals fans when you look at Aguayo, who was widely regarded as the best kicker in last year's draft, and really one of the best ones to come out in quite some time. Uh, you know. 
see him struggle the way he did, which was complete a complete 180 from what he did at Florida State. Uh, that that's got to be concerning. And and you do have we did have a couple of people in the YouTube chat uh, talk about. Um, I think it was uh, Royal Royal Flush five one three that said something to the effect of, uh, you know, Jake Jake Elliott in the kicking game is something that uh, he's he's looking at as well. Um, I will be looking at uh, Nick Vigil as he will probably be going up against a variety of running backs, a variety of tight ends, and one of which is OJ Howard, who was a guy that obviously a lot of Bengals fans wanted as well this year. Um, instead of maybe even instead of John Ross at number nine, uh, he was a guy that a lot of people a lot of people thought would would be the pick for the Bengals, especially with Eifert's status, both rehabbing an injury at the time and uh, you know going into a contract year. A lot of people thought he might be uh, Howard might be the pick, but the Bengals seem to be going with Nick Vigil uh, in terms of a quote unquote starting type of position. Uh, like you said, Lawson may be a guy that that rotates in on passing downs to rush the passer. Uh, Vigil is a guy that they like because of his quick feet, his agility, his speed, his range. Uh, seems to be a guy that, you know, th- we've heard some reports in practice where he kind of has uh, – he's kind of a guy that has stuffed some of the passes to the flat – all of that in practices. It's going to be interesting to see if he can run with a talented tight end like an OJ Howard, if he can contain some of, uh, potential screen passes, things like that, and actually be a very good complimentary piece to Kevin Minter and Vontez Perfect at the linebacker position. Uh, you know, you also look at uh, a couple of other guys, uh, you know, Michael Johnson going up against, I believe it's DeMar Dotson, their, their tackle. Uh, you know, a, a guy that has really kind of soured in the eyes of fans lately, uh, he probably won't get a lot of snaps, but uh, you know he probably needs to start making the most of them, and he's he's probably not in danger of being cut either, obviously. But uh, you know, a guy that needs to really start showing some more as a as a starter, get on that stat sheet and, and kind of perform a bit more uh, than he had, especially last year. Um, so those are a couple that I see coming up, and I do actually have a player matchup uh, piece going up on cincyjungle.com this week. Uh, so check that out. We, there, there's a couple more in there. Scott, we, we talk about, you know, I, I said this earlier, we talked about, you know, what even though wins and losses don't necessarily matter in the preseason, there are goals to achieve. There are, uh, you know, things that coaches want to see in these games from particular units in particular situations that sort of thing. What are a couple of goals that in game one, obviously the, the team's going to be a little rusty. They're, they need to, you know, as they say, knock the rust off the pads, that sort of thing. Uh, there hasn't been a ton of hitting in Bengals practice from what I understand, which is kind of interesting. But, uh, you know, what, what are – aside, I think we can all agree, obviously, staying healthy, not getting major injuries, that sort of thing. That's a goal you always want to achieve. But – what are a couple of goals that the Bengals should be looking at in this first game, especially against the Buccaneers? Yeah, I was going to say definitely uh, health was probably the first three things you want to see. Right, right. Uh, after that, I, I think for me one of the biggest things is the first teams, offense and defense and special teams, just not stinking up the joint. I mean, you don't want them looking absolutely horrible. I mean, they're going to be a little rusty. They're going to be getting out there for the first time. But you want to be able to see that – you know, there's some life that, you know, we, we don't have a ton of work to do. Yeah, there's some issues here and there. There's some fixable things. If they go out there and the offense goes three and out and, you know, Dalton gets sacked nine times and they rush for negative five yards, even if you're not, I mean, you're not trying to win or lose, but that's not what you want to see. And same thing if your defense goes out there and gives up, you know, three or four consecutive, you know, 10 yard uh, or 10 play 80 yard touchdown scoring drives. That's something you don't want to see either. You, I mean, you want to see something that looks, even though you're not really trying to win and you're playing base defenses and base offenses, you're trying to, you know, figure things out. You're trying to see, can these guys line up in the right formation? Do they do what they're supposed to do? We're not trying to do anything tricky or silly, but you want to see uh, some execution out there of that. And I think that's the biggest thing. Hey, we've been practicing this 
do these guys show, you know, some level of competence, especially some of the guys we've mentioned who we need to see it the most from the two haven't shown it yet at any level, but you know, the, the Fishers, the boy, he's some of the new guys coming in and even the guy we haven't really hit on who are making their case to be starters this year, like uh, William Jackson, the third, Andrew Billings, you know, guys like that, that, Hey, we really want to see what these guys look like. Are, can they be at least effective? Because you're not, you know, you're not trying to run trick plays and anything silly. You're just trying to line up our guy against your guy, and I think that's the the thing that you want to see besides the health thing is you want to see that, yeah. When it's all said and done, we may have won or lost the game, but at least you you can go back and look at the film and say, hey, Andrew Billings looked good. He won his matchups. Or hey, Cedric Boy, he looked good. He gave up some pressures, but no sacks, and generally looked really good. So those are the kind of things I think you you want to see. Agreed. So, it's definitely the new, the new people. Yeah, agreed. And uh, I, I'm going to kind of go along that same theme of execution. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the offense because that's really where the team struggled, especially um, down the stretch last year with with injuries and whatnot. And what the team – part of – I mean, there was a lot of issues that plagued the Bengals – last year to get them to six, nine, and one. But a lot of them, or a big part of the, those, the problem was the fact that they didn't maximize the opportunities when they had, uh, you know, a chance to get points, you know, whether they score a touchdown and, oh, great, and a miss extra point. Uh, they, they, they have a, a, they're deep in their own territory. They march down the field a bit. They kind of stall out, long field goal, miss field goal. You get down, you got first and goal within the you know ten or fifteen yard line, and you settle for three points. I, I would like to see, and granted, it's the first game. There's a lot of new faces, a lot of new pieces, but there is AJ Green, there is Brandon LaFell, a guy who's familiar with this system now. Um, you got Cody Core, who's in his second year of the of the system. Um, I would like to see them execute in the way of just maximizing the potential of points. Whether it's, you know, whether it's, again, kicking a, a long field goal, converting that um, by Jake Elliott would be great um, to see that see him do that. Um, getting a nice touchdown drive, converting the extra point. Or, you know, if you're if you're you've got a good drive and you're deep in an opponent's territory, step on the gas, go for the throat and make make the plays needed to get the touchdown. Um, you know, there's so many times last year. Wait, I mean, at the end of the year, we saw we saw the Bengals get 13 points, 16 points, up to, you know, 20 points at times was a struggle. So, um, you know, I, I think especially with Ross Mixon, uh, you've got guys back healthy, Bernard, Eifert, Green. Uh, you know, I, I think they just really need to – make an effort to get as many points as possible. Does that make sense to you? I mean, would, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, obviously you don't only points on the board and that was something Nugent did quite a bit of. So, you know, punching in, you know, like anything that does that as far as, you know, making the touchdown instead of the field goal, making the field goal, if you have the field goal, getting third inch short, not having Russell Bodine get pushed into Jeremy Hill and knocked on his butt for a two yard loss on third and inches. So yeah, all those things that get you those points. I, I, I think that you, you would like to see some competence at the end. Yeah. And you had some other, some other little tidbits on uh, Bengals and Tampa Bay, correct? Yeah. A couple other things I wanted to share and, as interested as I am in seeing Levante and Devante out there playing linebacker at the same time, <laughs> the, the two things I wanted to mention before we passed on, the, and we kind of alluded to one in the draft, O.J. Howard, how a lot of people had mocked him in the Bengals. Very interesting, since I am a big fan of the draft, is that the two guys, other than Ross, who seem to be most linked to the Bengals when – they were when the draft was actually happening when the way the picks fell were the players who are most popular. These are the Bengals are going to take was OJ Howard and another Alabama guy, defensive end, Jonathan Allen. Both of them fell to them. They obviously passed on both of them. We play Howard in week one of the preseason and Jonathan Allen is we're playing them in week two of the preseason against Kansas city. So I think that'll be interesting for fans to see. Okay, here's a guy that a lot of people are mocking to us. Here's a guy that some I'm sure some listeners really wanted us to take that we didn't take. So I think after these preseason games, we'll have a chance to say 
man, that guy was good. They can't believe it'd be whiffed on that. Or we'll be saying, well, thank goodness we didn't gra grab, grab that guy. The one last thing I wanted to share, and this really hasn't gotten as much traction this year as in years past, as in last year, but the whole AJ McCarron situation that isn't as big in the media as the Colin Kaepernick situation, but it is a quarterback story. Uh, we still have Jeff Driscoll on the roster, and if the season were to start today, I'm assuming they'd probably keep Driscoll on the roster, which means we're running with three quarterbacks on the 53-man roster, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So one thing I want to see is how does McCarron look and how does Driscoll look? Does Driscoll – because we really didn't get to see Driscoll last year because he was added late in the preseason after he was cut. So this was really a Bengals fan's first chance to see him play. And granted, he's, he's probably not going to be thrown to, you know, Eifert and Green. But I want to see what does Driscoll look like after having him on the roster for the whole season last year. Is this someone who really looks like he can be an NFL quarterback? And if so – does he look as good or better than McCarron? And if he does, then, you know, is there any chance we can move McCarron or are we just going to be sitting with three quarterbacks all year, eating up a roster spot that we could be using for depth on the offensive line, which is much needed or somewhere like defensive back, especially with the two safeties that are hurt. So that's another thing I really want to see. I just want to make sure that I had a chance to mention that was the whole Driscoll McCarron thing. Yeah. And McCarron is a and, lot of implications. Uh, yeah. Agreed. And, McCarron has looked quite good over the past couple of, of preseasons, which has kind of sparked a lot of this potential trade talk. And then obviously he played towards the end of 2015 uh, when Dalton was hurt there too. So a, a lot of talk there. And there was also someone who had tweeted at the uh, tweeted at us bang at Bengals OBI at Dr. My eyes, E Y Z um, responding to Richard Skinner, who is with, uh, I, I believe, uh, Local 12 of Cincinnati. Um, but he just, he added us onto it and said, AJ, meaning McCarron, should be our starter. It's that simple. And Richard Skinner actually provided a very interesting response. He said he actually has had a, tor a horrible camp and has been the worst of the three quarterbacks. He's still the backup, but hasn't played well at all. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um Hearing about that with, with McCarron, because all we've been hearing the past couple of off seasons was how good he looked in practices, how good he's looked in preseason games. Um, kind of an interesting thing there, uh, but we'll we'll see. And it's a it's a good segue because we're going into listener questions in just a second. But before we do, we asked a question of the night earlier about uh, allowing your children possibly to play football despite some of the health concerns and CTE concerns, the long-term health concerns. We did get a comment in the YouTube chat uh, on that as well from Amon Calicus saying, I had concussions playing high school football. Luckily, my sons chose soccer. Um, so you see you see his uh, his preference there as well. We did get some uh, some questions we're gonna get we're gonna get to those right now. We're gonna try and jet through some of these here. Um, I, I got to give it to Royal Flush because he put it right right at the top. He joined us early, right at the onset. I put a question at the top, uh, Scott. I'll, I'll let you go with this one. Why do the Bengals continue to rely on declining players for minimum production when they have younger players that can produce more? And he puts in parentheses, i.e., Michael Johnson, Pat Sims over the younger counterparts. Um, I'm, I'll just say this: Pat Sims recently was named the starting a defensive tackle opposite of Geno Atkins. Personally, I've been a big Sims guy, more so than probably some others. But uh, I think he's been a productive guy. I like Michael Johnson as well, but I do see the decline that that he's talking about here. Um, for me, I would say you know. You could you could shed some of these contracts and actually do some more in free agency with with some guys, but I mean that's just not the way the Bengals operate. Your thoughts? Yeah, I, this is definitely something that's been a big complaint by Bengals fans who have really followed the team closely, and it it goes back quite a ways. I mean, obviously, going back to um, the whole thing where they had Robert Math or not Mathis, <laughs> nice. Robert Gathers over Carlos Dunlap uh, for Dunlap's first few years, um, sitting Drake Kirkpatrick forever, uh, Ray Maluga continually starting. They Marvin Lewis has tended to have a uh, real love with playing the 
guys who are, you know, they aren't great, but they aren't horrible. They kind of, you know what you get. Um, the one in the hands is, in his opinion, much, much better than two in the bush. And he basically gave away the reason why in a press conference last year when he mentioned um, more or less that he was scared of playing rookies because you didn't know what you were going to get with them. But, of course, you didn't know what you were going to get with them because he doesn't give them a chance to play. So it was kind of a catch-22 where that he puts his rookies in. He doesn't give them a chance to show what he can do, and he's afraid of them because he doesn't know what they can do. That being said, this year seems to be a year where they're kind of going away from that. You mentioned um, making Pat Sims a starter, although I think a lot of us are expecting Billings to get a ton of playing time. A lot of people close to the team are expecting Mixon to get a ton of snaps, a ton of carries this year, which is very uncharacteristic of the Bengals. Uh, Lawson is projected to possibly get a lot of playing time over guys like Michael Johnson. Now, you know, when week one comes and, you know, we're playing that first game at home, we'll see if that actually happens. And all indications are through history, it hasn't happened. But this year seems to be a little different. I mean, they did finally get rid of Mike Nugent last year and they went and drafted a kicker. So Anything's possible. They seem to be going that direction. He might finally be, he being Marvin Lewis, might finally be changing his tune. And maybe, uh, you know, enough people like Royal Flush 513 are kind of, a, uh, you know, have had that mindset. It's nice that maybe Marvin Lewis is starting to get that mindset too. Yeah, and we'll see. There, there was someone, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for the question itself to see, to credit the person. Unfortunately, I can't find it at the moment. Um, it was asking about how many snaps you th we think uh, Joe Mixon will will get this year. That's kind of a hard question to answer. I don't I don't have an exact answer, but I'm going to agree with James Napke in the in the chat uh, YouTube chat who says I bet Mixon doesn't start until week six. I, I you know I don't know about starting. I don't know about snap counts and all of that, but I do think the Bengals have a plan for Mixon to get probably. 15 plus touches a game and he's a he's a guy that can catch the ball he's a guy that can obviously run the ball well um he is actually i believe in the it's either punt or kick returns he's second on the depth chart there it's interesting uh obviously did some of that in college but um I, you know i i know it's hard to put a, an amount uh, of snaps on how, you know mix what mixing could get in 2017 but you know, what do you, what do you think in terms of role as the year goes on? Based on everything that Marvin has done in his past, I would be surprised if he got more than a third of the snaps and a third of the carries. And the reason is historically look at what they've done when Giovanni Bernard came in as a rookie, he was competing against Ben Jarvis Green Ellis and Bernard had a much better first year, was a great receiver, much more elusive, was shifty, dynamic. They still gave a bulk of the carries to the law firm. A few years later, Jeremy um, Hill has his rookie year, and we all remember that second half where he was just phenomenal. He led the NFL in rushing from week eight on to the end of the season. Despite that, he still only got half the touches in the second half of the year. And you know, instead of feeding the hot hand, they kept splitting. Nope, we're giving Geo these touches and Hill these touches. We don't care if Hill's getting eight touches and 100 yards and two touchdowns. We're still going to split them 50-50. That being said, as you know, phenomenal as Mixon is, and everyone's saying the right things, until we see it, I think it's going to be hard to believe that uh, Marvin can change his stripes that way. So I would assume that you know what you and um, Kanapke and these folks are saying. I, I think it's true that until he proves us wrong, I think they're probably looking at a 30, 30, you know, a third 30, 30, 33, 33, 33 split where. Hill's probably going to start. He's probably going to be the guy that runs on first down, gets two yards, running up the middle. Bernard's going to be the third down guy. Mixon's going to alternate kind of here and there. He's going to play a little on second down. He's going to get, you know, five, six, seven carries a game. And then you just have to hope at some point in midseason, either he does enough that wows them or, you know, you don't want to see someone get hurt. But barring something drastic, it would just be really surprising to see them veer away from that too much this at least the, this this first year uh, yeah and I, I tend to agree with you but you know with marvin lewis's contract status and the fact that they just showed so much interest in mixing and they they seem to and he's already showing a lot early in camp i 
I just don't know how their hand isn't forced. If if he proves, I mean, obviously practice is one thing and games are another. Um, you know, if he goes out in the preseason and he's getting, you know, 3.3 yards a carry, then that, that's a completely different story. Uh, but if he's doing the things in the preseason, especially against, you know, not necessarily starters, but number twos, number threes, um, you know, if he's doing those same kind of things in, in those – types of scenarios in game type situations, it's going to be hard for the, the team to say, you know, oh, well, we have to, you know, we have to split it upright. We have to make sure Hill starts this series and, um, you know, we'll split it up this way. I, the point is zampezi has got a lot of weapons and he's got to split them. He's got to, he's got to find the right plays for the right players and get people in the right positions to succeed. Um, but interesting stuff. Obviously Joe Mixon has been a, a hot topic on a variety of levels since he's joined the Bengals real quick one. Um, really not much to say here at T rock 1020 on Twitter. gave us a tweet uh, asking is the first team offensive line going to play the whole first half this Friday. Uh, our friends at Cincy jungle already answered it. And I, I would say, uh, I, I would agree with the assessment. Um, they wrote probably just the first quarter, maybe some specific guys for longer. We talked about this earlier in terms of Cedric Abwehi and Jake Fisher. We may see them a little longer. Um, let's maybe get out of here on on this one, Scott. Uh, we're, we're going along here, but uh, we're getting a lot of questions, which is awesome. Um, Ra- Ralph Phoenix writes, Will Clark or Wallace Gilberry, if you had your choice, between the two. Now, Will Clark's obviously been a little bit of a disappointment since uh, joining the Bengals in the third round uh, a few years back, and um, I believe he's in a contract year now. Um, Wallace Gilberry just keeps coming back on these rental deals, and, and uh, you know, he, he still kind of makes plays here and there. Um, he, not, to the, not to the effect that he did maybe in 2013, 2014, but um, – Still a guy who may be effective in certain packages, but if you had your choice between those two, Will Clark came off his best season as a pro last year. Um, well, who would you choose? Did you go with the youth? Do you go with the guy that um, knows the system and, and, and plays pretty well in, in Gilberry? I think if we're going with one, uh, I, I think we are uh, – I think I'd have to go with Clark. And the, I think one the reason I would say that is you mentioned he did have a good year. I think he had four sacks last year, which was a career high for him. He, uh, I think the biggest reason is if you look at where we're strong, we te- we seem to be very strong at uh, defensive tackle, the linebacker. Actually, we're strong at a lot of positions, I think. But the one where uh, Gilberry's role seemed to be that guy who could play the edge and also rush the passer where Michael Johnson was more your traditional non pass rushing guy. Well, now we have uh, Willis in there and we have Lawson in there, both of them were drafted. One thing they're supposed to be pretty good at is rushing the passer. So that being the case, and that seemed to be the biggest thing Gilberry was good at, especially his first year here. He's kind of cooled down after that first year, but that first year he was very good at, being a pass rushing guy who could come in situationally. Well, we now have two guys that can supposedly fill that role. So if we're going to keep one of them, I think I'd rather keep Will Clark because I think he can probably do more than that. That's not really his forte. His forte is more just being a back defensive end, a guy you can put out there in running plays and passing plays. You're not going to count on him on being that situational pass rusher because we have the guys they drafted this year in the third and fourth round to do that. So, Without thinking about it too much, I think I'd have to go Clark, and just because I think the role that Gilberry had is now uh, been taken over by some much younger guys, and and probably more effective guys. Uh, you, you know, I and, I and I like I like Gilberry. I like his attitude. I like his demeanor. He seems to really really like the Bengals organization. Really like being in Cincinnati. Um, he's been a productive guy for them as a rotational guy. Um, he's done, you know, he's stepped in when guys have been hurt and, and played pretty well. He's the guy that has done, you know, filled numerous roles. I like the guy. I just think you got to, you know what you get out of him. And if you, you believe you started to scratch the surface with Clark last year, um, and, and granted a lot of that production I think was early on in the season. Um, I think if you, if you believe you have scratched the surface there and there's more to be had, um, in this youth movement with a lot of younger, faster, more athletic guys, I think 
you do that. And there, there's even talk that they might be, you know, using Clark in, in this defensive tackle rotation as well, a guy that can maybe kick inside on certain passing situations. So um, obviously, uh, you know, a guy that they think they could do different things with. Um, again, I like Gilberry. I just think you, you might want to go Clark in this situation. I, I think I agree with you there, Scott. Thanks for all the questions tonight, guys. There's a ton more. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, but we appreciate all of the feedback. We appreciate all of the live listeners. We started a little bit earlier than we normally do, so we appreciate you you hopping on. Uh, schedules have been a little hectic. Personal schedules have been a little hectic the past uh, past couple of weeks, at least at least for myself. I don't want to speak for my co-host, but uh, we still wanted to you know make sure that we get this podcast out, we get it to you, and we talk some Bengals with you. Let's hope that the Bengals stay healthy as they host the Buccaneers this week. Obviously, catch the telecast, catch the live telecast if you're able, and, and even check out Hard Knocks. You'll probably see some some Bengals footage on there, I would imagine. Um, uh, you know, they're usually, they usually show the opposition as they play them. Uh, Scott, any final thoughts before we get out of here? Yeah, I think uh, it'll be very interesting. Next week will be the first podcast where we have actually talked about a Bengals game or something on the field. In quite some time, I think they last played 222 days ago, so that'll be that'll be an interesting change of pace. So instead of us just trying to think of stuff to talk about, we'll actually have something that needs to be talked about. Um, the other nice thing is, as I mentioned before the podcast, I was playing football with um, a three-year-old, so looking forward to hopefully uh, showing him some technique. He, there's still some issues with um, he's more like Taylor Mays. He likes to hit more than wrap up and he is more like a rookie Jeremy Hill. When he gets tackled, he tends to drop the ball on first contact. So <laughs> some things we need to work on and I'm hoping, you know, by the time he turns four and five, you know, that, so we'll maybe uh, study the film uh, closely on Friday and, and get some of those issues uh, taken care of. Yep. Yep. And uh Again, hope the team stays healthy. And for those Bengals, I mean, I think I, everybody obviously wants to see a win. Everybody wants to see the Bengals do well and win. Um, I think we all need to stay. If the Bengals do not win, I think we need to take a step back off the ledge a little bit and uh, say, you know, this is preseason game number one. Uh, I'm not predicting the loss or anything. I'm just saying this is preseason game number one. And, uh, you know, we, we – you might see some things you really like, and you might see some things that look really ugly because it's the first real game in quite some time that the Bengals have played. I, as I think, as you mentioned, the last real game we talked about on this podcast was the season finale against the Ravens, right? Right, just after the new year um, when the Bengals won that game. So, uh, you know, have some fun with it. Check out some of the new faces on there, uh, it, and as I mentioned throughout this show. First of all, thank you for all the live listeners and all of the questions, as I mentioned earlier. We appreciate your, your feedback and giving us those. If you are unable to join us live on YouTube at Cincy Jungle, you can check out our content on SoundCloud, on iTunes, on YouTube, and at Cincy Jungle. So please do so. Uh, also with Cincy Jungle, check out all of the news, notes, analysis. Uh, Scott and I also write for that site. So uh, go check that out. I mean, obviously the beat writers do a great job. Uh, covering the Bengals, we we help uh, put kind of put that other news out there as well as our own news, our own analysis as well. So please check that out. You can also get in touch with the show on Twitter at Bengals OBI via email, the OB Insider at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Thank you for all your support. Thank you for your downloads. Have some fun this weekend and uh, check out the first actual game of 2017 by the Cincinnati Bengals. Thanks for uh, tuning in. We'll see you next time. For Scott Schultz, I'm Anthony Cazenza. This has been the Orange and Black Insider. See you soon.